thanks very much everybody and particularly to Kelvin and Sharon for helping just get this amazing meeting together. I've been so impressed and I think I've been re-inspired even though I have been doing this for now, I think it's 25 years, 25 years in Otitis Media. I do need a boost of inspiration every now and then and Kelvin certainly delivers that beautifully. I had hoped to be able to talk about the Centre of Research Excellence website today, uh, but we're still saying opening soon. So um, that will be hopefully a good one-stop shop for people wanting information about otitis media and research and particularly any opportunities to get involved in research. And we do want a lot more of that. Obviously there's great things happening here, but we need more. So I'm, I'm going to talk today about Synfrix. It's a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and um, it's, it's pretty special uh, and, and very unique. Uh, we do have pneumococcal conjugate vaccine here in Australia, the 13 valent vaccine now, but I'm going to go back in time a bit and just talk about whether this vaccine really has a role for Aboriginal children uh, in Australia. So I'm going to talk about the microbi oops, microbiology data from international studies that have been published and then our own work where we compared um, these three now vaccines, conjugate vaccines in the Northern Territory, and a systematic review of some of the early data from the Previx Combo study that uh, Nick uh, talked about this morning. So first of all, um, some acknowledgements, of course, to the traditional owners of the land where we're meeting today, the, the Awabakal people, and also to acknowledge the um, Warumai people and to thank uh, the Aboriginal people here in the room. I mean, it's just fantastic to see so many more Aboriginal faces at these meetings, researchers and research officers, and um, you know, we just want to support you so much and keep you coming to these meetings. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the team members in, that have contributed to the work I'm going to present now. Uh, there's too many of them over those years, of course, to name them all, but this is the current team working on the Previx trial. Our work in uh, many, many Aboriginal communities now, oh, I, I think uh, Jemima, who's here, has got a database of all of our studies that we're co now co connecting together. And uh, I think we've got something like 12,000 individual children in that database now. So it's pretty amazing the number of kids that have been involved and we thank the families. Now I want to show you um, a YouTube uh, link, which I think the... Um, Do I do that? Just leave it alone. So why is otitis media important? And uh, this little YouTube clip shows us a, a simulation of hearing loss. And if you old like me and you know the Fred Flintstone cartoons, Fred really yells a lot. And uh, this YouTube just goes through, and there's an audiogram shown as well to show you what mild and moderate hearing loss is like when they're talking to each other. And I've shown this, I mean, you people all know this terribly well, but I've shown this a number of times now. It's surprising how many people come up to me afterwards and say, that was so amazing. It just really turned the light on for me about what's happening with mild and moderate hearing loss. Because I think those terms uh, don't really do justice to um, children with mild or moderate hearing loss. It's a debilitating. It's going to work. A one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Aha! Uh -huh. You're on my apartment building on Granite Avenue. You owe me 300 bucks. Get it up. Freya, take it easy. It's only a game. Well, Ma, I'm just like them big tycoons. I play to win. Now, Barney, pay up or get out of the game. <laughs> Okay, so I think it's pretty impressive to think that, um, and I spoke to a paediatrician just last week that came up to me and, and talked about that, and she said, I'm not going to ignore uh, moderate hearing loss anymore when I see those reports coming back from the audiologist. She really does understand what's going on with that now. So I'm looking at a different screen on here to there. Uh, so um, this is a survey that we did in 2013, um, and as Peter said, the rates of perforation have come down a lot since we first started our surveillance in remote communities in the Northern Territory. But still only 7% of children have uh, bilaterally normal ears, 50% having otitis media with effusion, and 30% having uh, a bulging eardrum, AOM, a smaller number having acute 
perforation and then 6% having chronic suppurative OM, another 3% having dry perforation. So that's the data even in 2013 from, rem this is now 15 remote communities. A lot of our work initially was just in the Tiwi Islands, but this is clearly what's happening across um, remote areas. So what are the bugs? We've heard from uh, people, this morning, Nick, this morning about the importance of Haemophilus influenzae and also um, the fact that we do find in young children the red bar just as much Haemophilus influenzae in the chronic suppurative OM as in AOM with perforation. So this is a really important bug and there is no vaccine for this, this bug. There is a vaccine for pneumococcus, the dark blue bars, and that uh, dark blue bar is actually made up of a whole lot of different serotypes and strains and the vaccines cover a proportion of that. Um, interestingly, uh, one of the, um, oh, we don't perforate drums with cotton buds, but we do um, want to promote the collection of ear discharge samples from as close as the drum to the drum as possible. Uh, and this is what's given us this really, really important information uh, about what's actually happening in the middle ear. We've always claimed that looking at the nasopharynx is a pretty good estimate of what's going on in the middle ear, but I'll show you that that's not always the case. So this is just a summary now of the international literature on, um, on this vaccine, which has this Haemophilus component. It's not licensed for Haemophilus disease, but very cleverly the company used the protein from Haemophilus influenzae to conjugate to the pneumococcal serotypes. So there was some efficacy in their first trial published in 2006, 36% less middle ear infection with Haemophilus influenzae with this vaccine. So of course when I read that I was just over the moon, I thought we have to have this vaccine. Um, I, this is a long period of time now, seven years before really any more substantial data was published uh, from the international literature, and this is from the Netherlands, showing that that vaccine made absolutely no difference to the haemophilus in the nasopharynx, so the carriage was unchanged. Uh, then the GSK also did a huge study in the uh, Latin American countries, and they wanted to look at NTHI AOM by tympanosynthesis. And unfortunately, they didn't get a lot of cases. They were grossly underpowered, but nonetheless, they found absolutely no significant impact on the middle ear. So unlike their initial vaccine, this showed no effect in that population. So in Kalifi, in Kenya, they introduced this vaccine into their standard schedule, and they found a significant reduction in Haemophilus influenzae carriage in the kids. So again, we're seeing some very variable data in different populations, different types of studies. So we feel that um, we're very confused still about that, this vaccine. So fortunately in the Northern Territory, we did have this opportunity where this FIDCV10 was introduced in, in licensed in Australia in 2009, and only the Northern Territory t decided to use it, probably because it had at least three more pneumococcal serotypes, but I think also the interest in the Haemophilus component. Um, and we had the opportunity, therefore, to continue our annual surveillance, and these are the years that we did that surveillance, starting from pre, pre any conjugate vaccine there. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, it doesn't reach. And that's where we found the 24% perforation rate and then going on further each, each year with the surveillance of... And this is the first publication where we compared the seven-valent vaccine with the 10-valent vaccine with the Haemophilus component. And we found that actually there was less bulging drums in the kids that had, had Synfrix, but they had more otitis media with effusion. So overall, we didn't have a benefit for otitis media, but it seemed like there was less bulging, which may be interpreted as having less progression to perforation or perhaps less antibiotic use. But we only had the two-year snapshot to look at that. Um, the next publication was about the, um, the nasopharyngeal carriage. Um, oh, sorry, this is that same, uh, same findings for otitis media. The um, red bar being the FIDCV, and the otitis media with effusion increasing by 12%, but the suppurative OM, meaning bulging and perforation, reduced by 16%, which was statistically significant. Uh, that finding was uh, relevant across all age groups, so still reductions in uh, suppurative OM across all those age groups, except the very young and the very old, uh, older children, which is sort of what you would expect. You're um, really having the biggest effect in the children most likely to have had uh, three doses. So then the microbiology reduced middle ear infection. This was so exciting and amazing. We didn't expect to find this at all. No impact on carriage. All those bars are pretty much equal across all those bugs between the, the blue and the red. 
but um, the ear discharge microbiology, those uh, liquid gold uh, samples of the ear discharge that were collected by these hardworking researchers in the field showed significantly less Haemophilus, around 27%, which is a bit less than what they reported in the POET study, but very exciting findings. So again, all of the problems of cross-sectional comparisons and so on, but we were encouraged to uh, think that that work was uh, really, really important. So when the Territory finished using this vaccine and shifted to PCB13, well, of course, our hypothesis is that Haemophilus would boost up again and be more common in the middle ear of children that no longer had the, the Synfrex vaccine. So we did this next comparison. And so this is now the three vaccine groups together normal, otitis media with effusion, and any suppurative OM. And you can see the red and the green bars are about equal. So there was no further improvement in, in disease. Looks like there's some reduction in, in perforation happening there, but the numbers were quite small. So statistical significance with the PCV13 group was quite difficult to demonstrate. So what happened for nasopharyngeal carriage? As I said, we're expecting perhaps the Haemophilus to go up. We hadn't found a significant impact on carriage, but surprisingly, Haemophilus went down in the PCV13 group. So there's some of the, the biological uh, swings and uh, roundabouts, I think, with this sort of work. But anyway, we'll continue on. Uh, ear discharge microbiology, a very small sample size, but uh, we did the Haemophilus did go back up again in the children's ears in the PCV13 group. Non-significant, um, but I would like nothing more than to be able to show that this uh, Haemophilus vaccine is having an impact. So I just want to go now to the trial that Nick introduced you to earlier. Uh, so we're, our question in that study is actually is a combination of these two vaccines going to be acceptable and of benefit for Aboriginal children. The PCV13 clearly has three more serotypes, one of them quite important, uh, and Synfrix has the potential, possibly, uh, with an uh, eye of faith, uh, an impact on Haemophilus influenzae carriage. So we can't report any results at this stage uh, on that, other than some preliminary analysis that was done by a medical student that came and did some voluntary work with us and got uh, really involved in a systematic review. And in that systematic review, he reviewed all the literature um, published on pneumococcal, any pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, and the impact on carriage after one dose, after two doses, and after three doses. So most people report you know, the, the impact after three doses. So he looked for that data and published this uh, uh, analysis in vaccine. And this is uh, just a part of his uh, data reported. I'm not showing you the pneumococcal work. We don't have time to show it. But this is the um, plot showing uh, one versus zero. I'm sorry, the point is not working. Oh, is it working? OK, this is one versus zero. Um, this is our own data from the Previx trial. And it's showing that after one dose compared to no dose, um, it favours the vaccine. So the vaccine was actually having a, an impact on carriage, which didn't quite reach significance. So that's crossing one. But after two doses, there's almost no impact of this vaccine on Haemophilus carriage in, in more than just our own study. And then in more studies, again, after the three doses, almost the opposite, we're having a, a more carriage in the vaccinated group. So how confusing is, is all of this work? And then Tom, for their pneumococcal um, conference in Glasgow this year did a, another analysis of the data because we had a little bit more available and he found that this actually was, was continuing in that same direction. So now we have a significant impact after one dose. He hasn't looked at the rest and we just think that that, um, you know, watch this space. Uh, how useful is that? I'm not going to try and um, estimate that but there's another study that was very interesting also done by Anne Chang's group about with this vaccine. And this is children that already have established chronic suffocative lung disease. And they decided to give these children two doses of this vaccine compared to meningococcal vaccine. And they looked at outcomes uh, over a 12 month period. And just to briefly summarise, they didn't find an impact on exacerbations of the chronic suffocative lung disease, but they didn't, did find a significant impact on respiratory symptoms after even one dose and again after two doses and a significant impact on the use of antibiotics uh, in that cohort. So again, there's another little dim light at the end of the tunnel perhaps for this vaccine. 
Uh, an immunologist, Susan Pizzuto, also found that there was a NTHI specific cell mediated interferon gamma and humoral uh, IgG immune response in those children with chronic subacute lung disease. So some biologically plausible um, support for that. So in conclusion or in confusion, um, regular, uh, regular standardised uh, surveillance has been important in keeping track of OM prevalence, but we need more, I believe, to, uh, to really keep track of what's going on over time. Uh, data on vaccine efficacy for NTHI carriage and infection are still, I believe, inconclusive, and our trial, we hope, will be able to answer some questions uh, about that, uh, both immunogenicity, uh, nasopharyngeal carriage and otitis media. Uh, correlates of NTHI protection in the middle ear are needed. I've described to you perhaps an impact in the middle ear that's not happening in the nasopharynx. We need to better understand that. Um, other predictors of otitis media, of course, are still incredibly important. This disease is still, as we described, starting so early in remote areas that uh, other interventions that are effective in preventing that early onset are needed. Vaccines may work after one dose, as I've tried to show you, um, but uh, we need more. So new generation vaccines and therapeutics are clearly in the pipeline, uh, and, but they need to be val evaluated in this population because we just can't translate an effect size in a population in Europe or, or the US to what's happening in these high-risk kids. Uh, so we need indigenous researcher capacity and leadership uh, to ensure that this research is possible, is acceptable and is sustainable. Clinical trials are not easy and um, there's been a stigma around these for many years so we need indigenous people to help us decide what's important, how to do it well uh, and to guide us through the future because we certainly need a lot more research. Uh, so we would like to see in the CRE, Centre of Research Excellence, would like to see an Indigenous Clinical Trials Network of some sort. And it needn't just be in otitis media, it could be Indigenous people working in clinical trials more broadly, but people that really understand methodology, quality of research and how it should be applied to their um, high priority questions, not just our questions. So see, these are some of the fantastic people in the team. I've pitched some photos that some of you will know who've been in the in the media and, and Kelvin in the middle there is really our supreme champion. I'm so pleased that we have him. He's just wonderful. So thanks everybody for listening. <laughs>